everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Capillary Electrophoresis in Cancer Research Today, Utility of Fragment Analysis in the Era of NGS-Based Translational Research and Clinical Molecular Diagnostics. I'm Christy Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, please visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I would now like to welcome our speakers. Dr. Steve Jackson, Senior Member Applications Development, Thermo Fisher Scientific, and Dr. Somak Roy, Associate Professor, Division of Pathology, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, Director of Molecular and Genomic Pathology Services. For complete biographies on our speakers, click the biography window at the top of your screen. Gentlemen, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Steve Jackson. I'm the Associate Director of Product Applications in uh, and Genetic Sciences Division at Thermo Fisher. And today's talk, I'm gonna tell you how some of our, our tools, uh, specifically those that are used for uh, uh, fragment analysis, are used for addressing cancer problems. And one thing I wanna make clear in this talk is that this is not gonna be focused on the capabilities of the instruments. What I want to focus on is that how the instrument can be used to address some of the problems that cancer researchers um, are finding these days. So um, just to start off with, the advantages of fragment analysis are that the workflow is very simple uh, and easy. Um, it's usually very quick to answer, usually less than 24 hours. The assay design is very flexible and can be tailored to many different types of queries, as you'll see in my talk here. And, that, and we also have solutions for microsite instability and copy number variability, important uh, avenues of research in cancer, which have been developed and are currently available. So um, these are some of the advantages of fragment analysis, um, and, and it's, it's been widely used for addressing a wide number of, of, of problems that are found in biology and in, in specifically in cancer research. So fragment analysis it, um, by CE works very similar to the way it works in an auto-rose gel. You're just simply looking at the size of DNA fragments. But the uh, CE introduces uh, the ability to multiplex uh, both the, uh, by looking at different sizes and by different colors. And it provides extra flexibilities that agarose gels can't provide. So for example, you know, um, let's say that you have a sample of DNA and you wanna analyze, um, in this case, what is there, seven different genes um, um, in, in the sample. You'd extract and purify DNA or, or RNA, make cDNA, whatever is most appropriate. The next thing you would do is you would design primer pairs that would, uh, are specific for the different genes you want to analyze. In this cartoon here, I, I have designed forward and reverse primers uh, for each of the different genes. Now, I have also labeled uh, the, the five prime end, the five prime primer, um, or it, it, one of the primers with a fluorescent nucleotide that can be detected by a laser. Um, this then provides a, a color tag for that particular gene. If you also notice that the, the primers are placed in different locations that'll produce different size fragments as well. This is the second tag that allows you to, to, to uh, separate different molecules and see you know, what the nature of the sequence is based on size and color. The next step is that you take your sample and you do a, a PCR reaction. Um, in a multiplex PCR uh, uh, setup, you, know, you have all the primers together, you, you, analyze, or you, you amplify your sample um, and it'll produce a library of different, uh, different sized fragments with different colors that are on the label. The next step is to do capital electrophoresis. And in this case, just like an agarose gel, you're, you're putting uh, the, the fragments in a matrix um, and in an electric field. The negative charges of the fragments will, uh, will drive them towards the cathode. Um, and because they're in a matrix, the small fragments will come out first and the larger fragments will be more retarded and will come out later. The laser then is used to, to identify the floors that are on the different, different uh, tags. And the end result is that you get an electrophorogram that looks something like this, where you have a peak of signal intensity um, that will tell you the, the different colors 
And then on the x-axis is the, uh, the time evolution through the capillary, and this means the size. So you can see that gene A and B, you know, are the smaller size fragments. They come off first, and you can detect them early. Genes F and G are, are the later size fragments. I'm sorry, larger fragments, and you can detect them later in, in, the, in the capillary. So this, this analysis provides enormous flexibility because not only can you tag uh, um, sequences by different sizes, but you can tag them by different colors as well. So one of the uh, examples that we have for using this is with the multiplexed PCR uh, assay for respiratory pathogens. Um, bear with me for a second. I know this is not a cancer application, but, but it just shows the way that CE can, uh, fragment analysis can be used here. Um, I described to you the workflow here. We've collected samples, we extracted RNA, made cDNA, did a multiplex PCR, and, and uh, analyzed by fragment analysis. We designed a panel that included 11 different viruses, including three probes for SARS-CoV-2, plus an internal control. We designed this panel for respiratory pathogens, but the, in principle, the this, this same idea could be applied to other types of genomes or other types of nucleic acids, other pathogens, specific cell types, microbiome, et cetera. So on doing the experiment, the results kind of looked something like this. In the upper left-hand corner, we have a test where we had all uh, a pool of genomic RNA targets for the different respiratory pathogens um, and a multiplex PCR reaction that I described for you. Now, all of these are in, in the blue color, so you're only going to be seeing the, the, the blue, uh, uh, blue colored peaks for the presence or absence of the different pathogens. And when we have the, the, the pool of genomic RNA, you can see that there are lots of peaks that are produced, and they, they correspond to the sizes that we defined for the different pathogens. The, the, the uh, pathogens with the star, we were unable to obtain a, a functional RNA, and so these, those were not present. We also tested the individual um, geno genomes um, down to about uh, 1,000 copies of rhinovirus, H3N1, and SARS-CoV-2, using this multi multiplexed approach. And you can see very, we get very strong detection of these, uh, these pathogens um, from a multiplex panel. Now, th th this, this, again, kind of points to the fact that you can use fragment analysis for detecting specific sequences based on the size and based on the color that you choose. Another fragment analysis technique that is used for, for querying um, um, specifically SNPs is called snapshot. Um, this allows a multiplexed query of allelic differences. The way this works is that um, we design primers that end at a particular uh, uh, nucleotide that we know to be a, a SNP. So for example, for locus 1, um, we, we know that there's either a C or a T version, and so we design primers that, that are right up against that C, T uh, um, um, uh, nucleotide. We also have a, a library or a, a solution of dideoxynucleotides that, when incorporated by primer extension, um, will produce either a G, uh, uh, I'm sorry, will produce a blue color if there's a G, or a green color if there's an A at that position. Similarly, for a, for a different locus, we can use a different sized fragment. Um, and, and again, in this case here, we're querying an A. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the T is going to be able to bind the A and produce a, a particular uh, uh, size fragment that is labeled in red. A C, for example, also, you know, if, and you can do this for, for a number of different, uh, different SNPs uh, and query, you know, what the genotype is at a number of different loci using this approach. As a proof of concept for this, we designed a, a snapshot panel that queries KRAS uh, at position uh, 34, 35, 37, 38 of the cDNA. This corresponds to 12 or 13 of, of KRAS alleles. We then uh, obtained FFPE samples that had mutations at these defined positions, extracted DNA and analyzed with snapshot, uh, multiplex kit, and with gene mapper. And this is the results that we saw. So the blue peaks are the, are the wild type or the, the normal uh, alleles. Um, the colored ones are the, the mutant alleles, the ones that are pathogenic. You can see in the sample above, we have a, a 35 uh, G to T change here. You can see the red peak that's present. In a different sample, we have a C35 G to A change, and we have here a, a green peak. Um, they're heterozygous because the, the blue peak here, right adjacent to the, 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 um, the, uh, the red or the green peak, it corresponds to the normal allele of the KRAS. So this snapshot approach is a nice way to quickly uh, query uh, known defined SNPs uh, using fragment analysis. 
This was, this was used by one of our customers here in the study that Foresight et al. published in 2020. They wanted to find an efficient way to query the frequency of causal mutations in early stage lung cancers. And so what they did was they, they, de they designed a snapshot panel that allowed them to query EGFR mutations at, uh, L, uh, at uh, position 858 or at, at 790, uh, common KRAS mutations, common PIK3CA mutations, and BRAF mutations. This is a single multiplex panel allow them to query the presence of these particular mutations in lung, lung samples. They then used this panel to analyze 833 lung cancer samples, and they were able to get results. These pie charts here show the, 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 the library or the, the family of different mutations that they're able to identify. For all samples, they were able to see that there were KRAS mutations in about 25% of the samples, EGFR mutations in about, six, about 7% of the samples, et cetera. Also note that there were about 66% that, that uh, had mutations that were not uh, detected by this, this snapshot panel. If they, they further um, distinguish the samples from uh, um, adenocarcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas, they could see that the KRAS mutations made up a large majority of the adenocarcinoma uh, mutations that were detectable, whereas squamous cell carcinomas had uh, uh, mutations that were not detectable by this panel. Now, this, 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 uh, this allowed them to kind of do an initial screen uh, and, and, and find out which mutations were driving some of these, these, uh, these tumors in these different samples. And they said that due to this multiplex nature, this assay can detect up to 10 point mutations simultaneously from a very small amount of DNA. And they, they went on to say that these unknown mutations then, the patients that had these unknown mutations could then be screened using next-gen sequencing or some other approach that would allow a, a more sort of discovery-based sample. But, but using snapshot allowed them to, to stratify patients quickly and identify those that, that, uh, that um, uh, were either going to be, you know, uh, um, have a particular intervention strategy based on mutations are identified or need further characterization by next-gen sequencing, for example. So another type of fragment analysis approach which is useful is, is microsatellite instability analysis. So as you know, many types of cancer displays deficiencies in mismatch repair genes, and this leads to increased mutation rate across the whole genome. This higher mutation rate often means that there's a higher rate of new antigens that are produced, and these new antigens then could be attractive uh, candidates for immune therapies. Now, mismatch repair deficiencies are often detectable through changes in lengths in microsatellite sequences, but changes in these microsatellite sequences are often difficult to analyze in next-gen sequencing systems because these, these, these microsatellite sequences are highly uh, repetitive and aligning these, these uh, and determining the exact size of the microsatellite sequences is more difficult in, in next-gen sequencing. So fragment analysis is ideal for this. We, did, we came up with a kit called the TrueMark MSI assay kit, which allows a, a, a very uh, 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 easy to use uh, workflow for analyzing uh, microsatellite length changes uh, in tumor samples. The assay we designed contains 13 different microsatellite loci that, that are uh, useful for analyzing instability including the, the five widely used Bethesda standard uh, uh, loci um, um, that, are, that are widely used. We also included two highly variable STRs that are useful for sample identification. And finally, we, our software um, does not require a, an, an adjacent normal or a, a normal sample to be used. In other words, we, we have a large database of samples where we looked at the, the microsatellite length uh, variability in these, this large library of, of up to 1,000 different tumor samples across different, uh, different um, ethnicities and, and different, uh, different tumor types. And so our software can allow you to, to analyze your sample without having to, to run a normal sample alongside. It can make use of the database um, to look at what the normal range of variability of the microsatellite sequences are. The snapshot, I'm sorry, the screenshot on the, on the left-hand side of the screen shows the output from, uh, from the, the MSI assay um, you can see the range of normal uh, loci, uh, normal fragment lengths, and, and uh, um, altered fragment lengths due to microsatellite instability. The, the, uh, the software will make calls and provide an output uh, based on, on the uh, microsatellite uh, stability status of the tumor sample. Now, this was used by, uh, by a group, Brunetti et al. Um, they used uh, um, the microsatellite uh, instability, the Trumark microsatellite instability um, panel, um, to analyze endometrial carcinomas. Um, in this study, what they wanted to do was to characterize the, the molecular change that are found in these endometrial carcinomas. They started off by doing an ion amplicity cancer hotspot panel um, to characterize the, the, the types of mutations, the SNP mutations that were seen in these 
um, 33 uh, different uh, different tumors are displayed here in this in this uh, in this figure. You can see that there are there are a, a, a wide variety of different types of mutations that were found across these different sample types. They use the uh, uh, the TrueMark kit to analyze the microsatellite set, uh, state in each one of these same samples. Um, this is the output that they, they saw here, that each one of these different samples had a call of microsatellite stable, microsatellite instability low, or microsatellite instability high. Um, the software was able to make these calls, and they, they then looked for correlations between the microsatellite call and the, the SNP calls that were, that were seen with the ion torrent panel. Unfortunately, or fortunately, they were unable to find a, a good correlation, but they were able to make some insights and show that, that they're using these two uh, workflows you could characterize the, the, uh, the, um, the genomic status of these tumors uh, fairly readily. Um, the last thing I will talk about is MLPA. Um, L MLPA stands for Multiplex Lig Ligation Dependent Probe Amplification. This is a technique that was developed by a company in Holland called MRC Holland. Um, they they uh, use fragment analysis to, to make copy number detections um, uh, across different sites within the genome. And the way that it works is that they have defined panels that, that across um, uh, um, different regions of a locus. For example, what we have here um, on, on the uh, top left-hand side is a normal sample. These different peaks show that across this particular locus, they, they have um, a, a range of sizes that are detectable. And all these different, uh, different sizes are present in approximately the same, uh, same peak height, approximately the same amount. When you look at a patient sample here, you can see that, that fragment A and fragment B are, are about half the size of, of the other fragments that are present in this panel. And they have a, a particular software called coughalyzer.net, which will take the, the output of this, uh, this fragment analysis um, uh, um, result and plot the, plot the, uh, the, the, the changes. Um, that are seen. So in the, in the uh, reference samples, you can see that the, uh, the, the, um, the different fragments span the, the, the range of, this, uh, of, the, of the query of this particular assay. You can see that the different peaks, A, B, and C, all fall you know, uh, in the normal range. But in this patient sample, fragment A and B fall in, in about the half um, um, uh, peak height, and their software is very easily then uh, able to map back the fragments that were queried in the fragment analysis uh, to the locus uh, region. Um, and you can see that, that in this case here, this, this particular patient was heterozygous for, uh, for this region of this particular gene. This is very useful for looking for copy number changes, either gain of copy numbers or loss of heterozygosity in tumor suppressor loci. And, and MLPA sells a number of different kits which can make this type of query for for example, BRCA1 uh, or for TP53, et cetera. So there are other, frag other applications that illustrate the flexibility of fragment analysis that might be useful for cancer studies. Um, FLT3 um, often has a change in fragment length due to changes in the internal uh, tandem duplications. Um, this is ideally treat, uh, analyzed by fragment analysis in the same way that, uh, that the uh, macrosatellite uh, uh, loci are used. You can query specific methylation sites by using a snapshot. Uh, in this case, you would uh, either look at, um, at um, um, methylation specific, uh, uh, methylation sensitive restriction enzymes or analyze uh, biosulfide converted DNA using snapshot and make specific queries that way. And finally, you might be able to look at uh, fusion transcripts uh, by fragment analysis by placing primers at the junctions or near junctions of particular fusion uh, genes you might be able to find out which type of fusion transcript is present in the sample. And the multiplexibility of, of fragment analysis allows you to then make a, a query of multi, uh, multiple different types of fusions that might be present in, in, the, uh, in the tumor sample. So I'll just finish by, by uh, mentioning that Thermo Fisher um, sells a genetic analysis continuum. In other words, we have lots of different tools that, that are uh, specialized or uh, have strengths for different phases of a research program. Whether it's discovery-based, where you're looking at, at a, a broad um, um, query, looking at new sequences or discovering new sequences, making unbiased queries, doing whole genome or whole transcriptome analysis. Um, discovery uh, tools um, are, are important for these types of things. And we have microarrays and next-generation sequencing that can do these sorts of analyses. 
An another phase of a, a query is when you want to focus on particular sequences. This is either to confirm that a new allele is present, to analyze a panel of different genes, um, or to, to uh, sequence across a, a sequence of interest. Um, um, we have tools that, that allow this sort of uh, very specific focusing on particular regions um, for, for, uh, for groups of genes or a particular uh, uh, long sequence. And finally, we have tools that are very sensitive and very specific for detecting the presence or absence of particular sequences. Um, these are TACMAN assays um, and, and digital PCR or, or, or uh, regular TACMAN PCR. Um, and this is, this is used for once you have, have confirmed that a particular sequence is, is a biomarker, for example, um, you can use TACMAN assays to do a very highly uh, sensitive and specific query for presence of that particular sequence. Lastly, I'll mention that, that uh, we get a lot of, of questions about why um, Sanger sequencing is useful in the, in the context of next generation sequencing. And, and Sanger sequencing is useful because it provides an unambiguous determination of the mutational change. Um, it really, the, the peak is the peak in a Sanger sequencing reaction. Um, and you can have high confidence that a particular novel mutation is present um, because that the peak is, is present and unambiguous. Um, alleles uncovered by next generation sequencing, especially novel, especially novel alleles, should be and often are confirmed by Sanger sequencing, and therefore Sanger sequencing is a very important part of the uh, of the uh, of cancer research workflow. Some genomic changes are difficult to analyze by next generation sequencing. Uh, we mentioned uh, uh, microsatellite instability loci or these highly repetitive sequences, and so you know Sanger sequencing it, uh, and fragment analysis is useful for that. And finally, um, analysis of, of methylated DNA um, is, is an important avenue of research using Sanger sequencing. And this is because analysis of methylated DNA by next generation sequencing is, is complex, more complex than even just regular uh, next generation sequencing. You have to have a, a reference database that's built on, on a bisulfite converted backbone, and, and that can change also based on the, uh, the, the degree of methylation you're expecting. Again, though, Sanger sequencing just tells you whether or not the peak is present or absent. So it gives you a much more unambiguous answer um, um, about methylation state. So just in summary, fragment analysis by CE provides a simple and cost-effective solution for detecting specific sequences. The assay design is very flexible, and therefore you can do many types of queries using a, a fragment analysis. And we also have commercial kits that can analyze microsatellite instability and copy number variabilities that are important for cancer research. So thank you very much for your time. I would like to turn this over now to Dr. Roy. Um, please go ahead and start your talk, Dr. Roy, and we look forward to hearing about what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Stephen, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will start on with the second phase of the talk. And so what has been discussed by um, uh, my prior speaker, uh, which focused on the technology. My talk is going to focus on a uh, practical example of how we use that in a clinical uh, molecular diagnostic setting as well as uh, in a translational research setting. Uh, the examples I'm going to provide are going to focus on um, uh, what uh, are used currently uh, in the clinical setting, but these assays are also available uh, for research use in our uh, settings, so it kind of touches on both of these aspects. Uh, so uh, this is a disclaimer, I have uh, no financial conflicts of interest. Uh, in the outline, I'm going to just uh, go over uh, briefly upon the current state of molecular diagnostics for cancer um, in, in the current day and age, uh, and what are the advantages of uh, using fragment analysis as a method uh, in the context of uh, high throughput uh, sequencing as a modality for uh, using cancer diagnostics, and uh, then we'll follow up with some clinical examples. So as uh, some of you are aware of, uh, precision oncology and genomics, uh, the way uh, it works is in the entire life cycle of uh, a patient uh, beginning with the diagnosis, uh, going through a sort of treatment uh, to the point where uh, the disease is completely cured or there's a relapse and there's further uh, you know, diagnosis and treatment that is required uh, to manage that. 
and it does also include, and particularly in the setting of uh, pediatric cancer, uh, where uh, there are chances of identifying incidental germline findings uh, that would be of interest, um, you know, in, in in terms of assessing risk of of future cancer. And so, when we talk about all of these uh, uh, opportunities, where molecular diagnostic is critical uh, for management of patients with uh, with cancer. It is important that uh, the the right tool is used for the right um, uh, the right type of test. And uh, as we know, with uh, in in the past decade, there's been an explosion of uh, using high throughput sequencing, more commonly referred to as next generation sequencing, to be able to uh, simultaneously identify uh, biomarkers across uh, large regions of the genome and in some context in the entire region of the genome, and uh, to help identify and unravel information that will be helpful for diagnosis, uh, prognostication, and treatment of uh, patients with cancer. So how does a uh, laboratory workflow look like in, 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 a, in a typical uh, clinical lab or for that matter even a research lab? Uh, in the instance of a clinical lab, uh, it starts with the patient's uh, visit to uh, the clinic and upon uh, an initial diagnosis uh, by imaging or by other modalities, um, a specimen is obtained, and it could be a specimen which is uh, prepared from blood, bone marrow, any body fluid, or uh, tissue. Uh, once uh, the specimen is then available in the molecular lab, uh, it then uh, goes through the first most critical step, which is the isolation of the nucleic acid, that is DNA or RNA, from those specimens. And once it's obtained, then essentially uh, the molecular tests that are performed fall into two broad categories. Uh, the ones uh, that are um, uh, referred to as direct sequencing technology, which is where the DNA or the RNA sequence of interest is um, interrogated directly and uh, any variations or mutations are identified uh, by comparison of the obtained sequence to the reference genome, uh, in this case, the human genome. Uh, the other set of tests uh, are essentially uh, PCR-based tests that essentially indirect, uh, that indirectly provide an evidence of presence or absence of a genetic alteration, uh, whether that be fusion, whether that be uh, DNA alterations, a small or large mutation, and, and these are uh, the second class of assay. Uh, regardless of what the assay is performed, in the end it is uh, the test results are uh, interpreted and reported to the patient's chart, and it closes the loop of, of an intestine. Now, when we talk about these molecular techniques and technologies to be able to achieve uh, the different types of um, assays for uh, for cancer, uh, it essentially, again, it falls into two aspects, the direct sequencing and non-sequencing-based technologies. When you talk about direct sequencing, they fall into two categories. Uh, the more popular and currently used technology is, uh, as I mentioned, is NGS, or high-throughput sequencing. Uh, the other more traditional uh, approach is using Sanger sequencing, uh, which still remains a valuable tool in certain contexts where we're looking at uh, specific mutations or target analysis of a certain gene. Non-sequencing uh, methods, there are uh, you know uh, a lot of them, and uh, you know anything from uh, PCR and any different variations of PCR uh, are important. Uh, and this is where we'll uh, focus on and touch upon some examples of how. Uh, the capillary electrophoresis instrument or fragment analysis is used uh, to help with um, answering some critical questions and support uh, the molecular diagnostics for cancer. It's important to understand uh, that some of these uh, techniques uh, can uh, vary in range in terms of how big or small an alteration is looked at. Uh, so when we talk about non-sequencing method, usually these are low throughput but very focused on identifying specific genetic alterations as compared to something like NGS, uh, which is uh, flexible where uh, not only large-scale alterations, but also more specific alterations, such as point mutations, can be detected. Uh, for any molecular test, whether it is high-throughput sequencing or a PCR-based assay, uh, it typically follows uh, the analytic validation um, uh, uh, protocols uh, for any high-complexity testing, following uh, the compliance with uh, CAP and uh, CLIA regulations. Uh, there are also available guidelines that uh, uh, sort of uh, provide the framework uh, to be able to achieve that uh, in a consistent manner. Uh, when we talk about uh, a typical NGS testing workflow, 
uh, it is fairly complex. And again, I don't want to get into the details of uh, how an NGS test is performed, uh, but really want to bring attention in terms of uh, what is required uh, in a typical setup to be able to um, uh, complement NGS testing when we talk about uh, the concept of orthogonal conformation. And uh, as uh, uh, the prior speaker had alluded before, um, NGS is a very complex asset. And uh, given the current limitations of the technology uh, with certain types of genetic alterations, uh, it is difficult to detect or sometimes require a, uh, a, a next a second level of confirmation to ascertain that uh, we minimize the amount of false positive results required, or false negative results for that matter. And so these orthogonal tests uh, or confirmatory methods are very many. Uh, one of the ones that is uh, popular and quite uh, cost effective is uh, fragment analysis. Um, the examples of what I'm going to show today, uh, at least the way it is practiced in our lab, uh, involves Sanger sequencing and uh, a set of PCR tests for targeted uh, mutations. So uh, uh, comparing NGS and fragment analysis, uh, I'm going to uh, give a high-level schematic of how we have some of these tests set up in our lab. So in this example, we are talking about the uh, FLIT3 ITD uh, uh, oncogenic mutation. This is a very well-described alteration uh, that is seen with um, uh, patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, the way the test is set up is we start with a peripheral blood or a bone marrow sample. Uh, the DNA is isolated from uh, that sample and subjected to PCR amplification, followed by uh, a capillary uh, gel electrophoresis, which is what the CE platform uh, uh, you know, helps us with. And so when you talk about the asset design, it's uh, actually quite simple. Um, in this example, the the green rectangle uh, refers to the Y-type uh, FLIT3 ITD, which is covering exons, the region of the exons 13 through 15. And then the the blue arrows over here are the primer binding sites, they follow the reverse primer that flank the sequence of interest. In the instance that a uh, FLIT3 internal tandem duplication mutations identified, uh, a duplicated sequence anywhere within the exon 13 to 15 region is detected. And as you can see here, when the PCR amplification occurs, it produces a larger fragment than what would be expected in a sample that has a Y-type uh, FLIT3 uh, gene sequence in the exon 13 to 15. Uh, the similar concept applies to the test when we talk about uh, the gene P core, it has a similar, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> it has a similar uh, internal tandem duplication uh, mutation that is seen in this gene, and it is uh, uh, seen in a subset of uh, brain tumors and soft tissue tumors. Uh, the process is fairly similar in terms of the wet lab preparation. Uh, the in this instance, the PCR amplicons are designed to flank the exon 15 of the P core gene. And when we uh, expect to, when we see a sample that has a B-core ITD insertion, the concept is very similar where we're looking for fragments of uh, size that are larger than the, larger in size than the wild type, uh, uh, the wild type uh, sample. Uh, the Sanger sequencing, uh, again, um, draws a lot of, uh, uh, you know, concepts similar to fragment analysis. Essentially, as was mentioned before, uh, it goes through uh, a, a series of um, uh, reactions. Essentially, uh, to begin with, we start with the DNA template of interest uh, that includes um, a primer that would bind to the region of interest of that template, and then uh, specially modified uh, nucleotides which are referred to as DDNTPs, uh, which are used then uh, to uh, essentially do the um, uh, diet terminating sequence by synthesis method. And as these different fragments uh, become available with the specific fluorophore tag, uh, after the sequencing reaction is completed, it is then passed through the uh, capillary electrophoresis system to be then able to generate an electrophorogram, uh, as is seen here in this example. Now, the advantages of uh, using Sanger sequencing uh, is the fact that it is a very well-established method with uh, highly accurate variant detection. Um, the data output is uh, fairly small, so it's easier to analyze. And it's a very cost-effective method when, we, when uh, the utility, utility comes to confirming uh, or looking for known mutations uh, or sequencing single gene or exons of target. Uh, 
when we talk about the design advantages of the method, of course, as compared to uh, NGS, uh, the sensitivity is not as high, uh, and it is also not scalable for multi-gene or multi-target detection. Uh, NGS, on the other hand, uh, has several advantages, where we talk about massively parallel sequencing, high accuracy of detection, uh, high sensitivity, and then a modality that allows us to uh, query for multiple different uh, genetic alteration. Uh, on a large scale, it is cheaper and faster, but of course, you know, when we talk about uh, focused single gene or single target testing, uh, Sanger sequencing is more cost effective. Uh, in terms of disadvantages, it's not really not a disadvantage, but you know, kind of the limitation or uh, you know, the challenge one has to accept is in terms of the uh, sophisticated bioinformatics that are required to uh, you know, analyze the massive uh, data that has been outputted and of course the initial cost that is associated with setting up this. So when we talk about uh, you know, the NGS versus fragment analysis, it's really not a versus uh, concept. It's more of how each of these technologies complement each other. Uh, NGS, of course, is kind of the, you know, the, the route to go in this DNA when we talk about uh, comprehensive cancer profiling. However, uh, fragment analysis uh, fills in some of the holes that are the limitations of the current NGS technology. One important thing is fast turnaround time. Uh, which is not possible uh, with NGS currently, given kind of what the protocols are required, uh, in being cost effective for very few or single targets, and as a good orthogonal confirmation platform uh, for NGS variants using uh, different techniques. So now we'll uh, show some uh, clinical examples uh, from, uh, from our uh, lab. So this is uh, the first case is a uh, patient, a two-year-old female who had a cerebellar tumor. It was diagnosed as a high-grade CNS neoplasm uh, with a small round cell morphology. Uh, when this NGS sequencing was performed, uh, there was a um, alteration that was expected to uh, be seen in uh, the B-code gene. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, the sequencing pileup. Uh, uh, the sequencing pileups here, each one of the uh, horizontal uh, rectangular bars, whether in the uh, orange or the blue color, represent the sequencing reads. And what we can see here is um, what we were expecting in this tumor is a B core internal tandem duplication or a B core ITD. Uh, that is extra duplicate sequence in the same region. However, uh, when we look at this uh, particular uh, uh, data here, it is not very apt. Uh, this variant was called by our variant caller. However, it was called at a uh, lower variant allele fraction. So uh, this is one of the very challenging variants to be detected using uh, using NGS. And so when we do some more sophisticated analysis of the same uh, data, um, we are actually able to identify uh, an alteration which is not directly, um, uh, you know, indicative of BCOR ITD, but it's an indirect evidence. And so what we see here on the right panel are the same sequencing reads in the same region of BCOR, uh, of the BCOR exon 15, However, when we look at our focus into these multicolored vertical bars in some of these reads, uh, these are referred to as uh, soft clip readings. Uh, when we talk about soft clip basis in a sequence, what that means is uh, there are these extra sequences that the sequence aligner algorithm has a hard time to uh, map to the reference genome, and it feels that these are poor quality bases, so they get uh, soft clip and uh, essentially um, marked as unusable reads. Uh, some of the modern variant callers are able to utilize this information to be able to rescue and call such variants, and that's what happened in our case. And so these uh, soft tip bases essentially represent that uh, the B core ITD mutation has uh, extra duplicated sequence. Now, again, as I said before, this is a very challenging variant to detect, and so it's often uh, helpful to make sure that we are able to uh, have some sort of confirmation. Uh, the way we have the uh, assay set up in, uh, in our setting, we are also able to look at uh, the RNA uh, sequence from the same gene, the B-code gene, to be able to identify the alterations. In this case, we do have a subtle hint here which indicates that uh, there is an, uh, three copies of the anchoring repeats that are uh, duplicated here in, in the region that is affecting exon 15 of the B-code gene. And so that is, you know, this is another piece of evidence that uh, supports the finding that we see in the DNA sequence. And so finally, when we uh, uh, ran the sample using our B-Core ITD PCR assay, uh, 
we were able to first, uh, the first thing that you see here on the screen is the B core identity wall type control. This is something that we always done to make sure that we don't have any contamination. So any peak seen in this narrow uh, gray region uh, corresponds to the wild type uh, expected uh, size of the of a, of a wild type uh, peak. That means um, that this corresponds to the normal B core identity sequence, uh, B core sequence of exome 15, and the region with the orange uh, rectangle. If any peak is seen here, <coughs> excuse me, that corresponds to the abnormal or the ITD uh, peak uh, that would confirm that there is a presence of the B core identity mutation. So as expected in this sample for the B-Core ITD, uh, the wild type control, we don't see any peak here. Uh, and in this particular example, when for this particular patient, uh, when we ran it, we saw a 90 base pair insertion in the B-Core ITD, which confirmed uh, what we had seen in the NGS factor. Uh, and the final diagnosis on this case was then rendered as a CNS tumor with B-Core ITD, which is a very specific WHO uh, uh, diagnostic entity. That, uh, that requires uh, the identification of this genetic alteration uh, by a molecular method. The second case is a case of an acute myeloid leukemia in a 24-year-old 24 24 year male. Uh, again, in this example on the left side, we are looking at the genomic sequence region from exons 13, 14, and 15 in the FLIT3 gene. And uh, looking at this uh, sequence pileup, we are not able to uh, clearly identify a, an insertion or a duplication happening in this region. When we again look for, specifically look for the soft clip bases, we are able to start to identify those soft clip bases uh, in some of the reads. And this is where uh, it gives you hint as to um, the presence of a FLIT3 ITD. Uh, again, this was picked up by a wearing collar. However, when reviewing that, we wanted further confirmation. So when the capillary electrophoresis assay, the PCR assay was done, again, this is the FLIT3 ID normal control. So we don't expect to see, we don't see a, a mutant peak in, the, in this uh, orange pink box. And so that, um, uh, that essentially states that there is no contamination. And this is an example of uh, a FLIT3 ID that was 202 base pair insertion uh, seen in, in, this, uh, in this sample. And so that, confirms the presence of this uh, of this ITD in the sample. Now, with FLIT3 ITD, these are, uh, as I mentioned before, are very, very challenging uh, variants to be uh, picked up, especially with the larger FLIT3 uh, ITD sizes, because they tend to approach the size of the uh, of the insert size of the uh, of NGS. And that's where uh, many variant callers uh, are unable to identify uh, this variant. There's a known limitation, and that's why it's very helpful to have a confirmatory assay, like a fragment analysis that could very easily be able to pick this up. Uh, more importantly, a point to mention here is um, in our laboratory, we have the FLIT3 ITD as a standalone assay. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, it is, uh, from a clinical workflow standpoint, uh, it is uh, critical that within the first 24 to 48 hours of uh, drawing the sample, uh, the clinical team needs to know the information about the presence or the absence of a FLIT3 ITD mutation to be able to initiate uh, the appropriate treatment quickly. Um, with the current state of NGS technology, that is difficult to do. And so uh, this is where uh, fragment analysis is exceedingly helpful to be able to turn out results in, in, in a very short amount of time. Uh, so in this case, uh, it was, you know, this was... Uh, uh, Diagnosis an AML with FLIT3 ITD. Uh, again, it's a very important prognostic marker for aggressive disease, and we are able to uh, do this uh, test very rapidly. Uh, another example I want to bring here, and this is uh, you know this is something that uh, poses a big challenge with uh, NGS and many variant callers that deal with uh, the variants that occur in high G series sequences. Uh, the example here is of the region for the TERT. Uh, uh, promoter region. Uh, there are two canonical variants that uh, are, uh, are uh, critical, uh, important mutations that tend to um, impact uh, the you know, tumor biology. And again, third promoter mutations are known across various different tumor types with different implications. Uh, some, some instances, they confer uh, a diagnostic value. In other, it is, uh, it is of prognostic uh, information. So it is very important that uh, uh, these mutations uh, are not missed. 
And so a false negative result from an NGS for a drug promoted mutation can have very serious consequences in terms of misdiagnosis and uh, mistreatment uh, for, uh, for patients. And so this is uh, the region that you see here uh, is extremely rich in G and C sequences. And this is a known uh, pitfall with any PCR or any sequencing assay that it can uh, be very problematic. As you can see here, the variance of interest here is in this central line, it is in the center of the screen within the two horizontal uh, vertical black lines. Uh, it's a G to an A change. But as you can see here on the surrounding edges, there's a lot of misalignment artifact. Uh, either there are deletions, there are insertion calls, there are SMD calls, and these are happening uh, primarily because of uh, the polymerase slippage that occurs in any high GCDH region uh, you know, when it is sequenced. And so in this example, uh, it was a, a, a brain tumor that harbored a C2550T mutation. That is one of the known hotspot mutations in the dirt promoter region, which you can see here can be very easily seen with this overlapping peak uh, from the C to the T change as expected here. So um, this is, again, a very uh, clean uh, confirmation of presence of uh, uh, dirt promoter mutation. And again, very helpful not only during validation, but also in in challenging samples and clinical cases where uh, it really it helps with uh, establishing uh, a correct molecular report that this particular uh, mutation is not present. So take home points, uh, as based on the slides I've shown before, the fragment analysis performs, uh, uh, platform plays a critical role in cancer molecular diagnostics. And the important thing here is uh, if there's a desire to create a faster runtime assay that can be used to detect very impactful mutations. It can be very easily developed using the fragment analysis method. And again, it provides a very cost-effective and robust orthogonal method to confirm difficult and challenging variants. And so with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your informative presentations. It is now time for our live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, gentlemen, let's get started. Dr. Roy, I'd like to start with you um, sure. with a few questions. Can fragment analysis be used for confirming gene fusions identified by RNA-seq RNA NGS? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there are uh, <clears throat> different methods of doing that. Uh, what we uh, use in our lab is in the context where we identify either a novel or a difficult fusion that, uh, you know, where the call using the RNGS pipeline uh, is a little bit um, uh, challenging or there are low number of reads or, you know, it is in a unusual diagnostic context. So we like to confirm those, you know, depending on you know, whether we are in validation or a real clinical case. Uh, the, the idea essentially is to be able to use uh, Sanger sequencing as part of the fragment analysis platform uh, to uh, get a sequence read and then uh, match that and confirm with what was identified in the NGS uh, to essentially uh, substantiate uh, what, was, uh, what was found as part of the fusion. Very good, thank you. And gentlemen, as I direct questions at both of you, if either of you have something you'd like to chime in as well, please just um, speak freely. Sure. So thank you, Dr. Roy. I'm gonna um, go with this question for you as well. What are the advantages of fragment analysis compared to NGS when detecting large insertion and deletion variants? Yes, that's another good question. Uh, so when we talk about large insertion detections, uh, you know, Typically, I think it is important to start with kind of a definitional uh, standpoint of what large is. Again, you know, there's not a consensus about what large is in, in the context. Uh, I would, you know, when we're talking about uh, NGS versus another method, uh, you know, with, with modern NGS methods, you know, the read lengths have been increasing, but I think they're still in the realm of short read uh, sequencing, at least for the most standard ones done in clinical lab. Uh, so when we talk about large insertion deletions, once we start to see things going beyond 150 or 200 base pairs, uh, the read either becomes, on the NGS platform, the read either becomes too short or exceedingly long to be able to um, uh, map correctly to the human genome. 
And that is where most of the pitfall comes in. And so when we talk about fragment analysis, uh, fragment analysis is, uh, you know, from a technical standpoint, it's a very simple, uh, but a very robust way to uh, identify to pick up these large insertion deletions because of the significant shift in the size of the PCR product that has been amplified. And so uh, that gives a very, if, it, if the assay is well designed on the fragment analysis, uh, it's a very uh, easy and uh, quick way to confirm uh, the presence or absence of that large insertion deletion. Uh, but that's predominantly the limitation of, um, you know, NGS technology at this point of time being predominantly short reads. Of course, you know, there are some newer technologies with longer read sequencing, but that's not, uh, you know, prime time or, you know, primarily used in clinical settings. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Roy. And Steve, let's hop over to you for this question. What kind of problems are not the best use of NGS? Okay, so we've heard a couple of them uh, from, from Dr. Roy and, and myself throughout the talk, and I'll just reiterate them. But before I do that, I just want to make clear that, that fragment analysis and Sanger sequencing is not going to replace next generation sequencing. There is very definitely a reason to be doing next generation sequencing experiments, and fragment analysis and, and, and Sanger sequencing can be used um, as a supplement, as a complement um, to next generation sequencing. So in laboratories, there are um, very, very important reasons for doing NGS, and there are very important reasons for doing uh, capillary electrophoresis. So some of the things that NGS does not do well, we've touched on these, um, the, the looking at, at um, uh, internal tandem duplications of genes, um, like the, the FLIP3, and, and uh, Dr. Roy mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the uh, B core locus. Um, both of these um, are, are difficult to make alignments definitively in, in a next, next gen database. And so determining the absolute length change of these is difficult to do. Um, another thing that Dr. Roy mentioned is, is looking at, at GC rich regions um, that because of slippage and because of the, the low complexity of, of, the, of the genome in that region, it's difficult to align that to, to a uh, uh, a next uh, a next gen uh, database, um, and, and finally, uh, when cost is an issue, um, you don't sometimes using next generation sequencing is, is trying to drive in a thumbtack with a jackhammer. It just is not necessary, and sometimes it's more appropriate to to just focus on a particular region by Sanger sequencing or fragment analysis, um, and 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 let NGS do the heavy lifts of looking at the whole genome. But, but just looking at, at a specific sequence, Sanger sequencing is sometimes a much more efficient way to go. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have time for a few more questions. What's the ideal fluorescence intensity in fragment analysis? So I can take a stab at that one. Um, I think what's most important is, is not the absolute intensity, but it's rather the signal to noise ratio. So, so if you have a good uh, uh, high signal to noise ratio, um, if your background is, is like say a half a fluorescence unit and your signal is 10 fluorescence units, that might be entirely appropriate to be able to confidently call a, a signal there. On the other hand, if you, if you have a, a, you know, 10,000 know, fluorescence units in your, in, your, you know, uh, in, your, in your test and your background is 5,000 fluorescence units, that's not a very good signal to noise ratio. And so you know, that, that's, that's not a good, uh, uh, metric to use for, for, for making a particular call. So, so uh, you know, I think that signal to noise ratios are more important. Um, and and um, although, I, and again, I would hesitate to come up with an absolute value for a signal to noise ratio as well. A lot of it kind of depends on the sensitivity and what the, what the problem being addressed is. Uh, in some cases, if it's just a presence absence test, you might be able to tolerate a lower signal to noise ratio if you're trying to make an absolute determination of the quantities of something. Thank you, Steve. And it looks like we have time for one more question, and I'm going to go with you on this one. Why would I use snapshot instead of PCR for allele detection? Um, yeah, so again, you know, the, the snapshot is simply another tool. You know, sometimes PCR is much more uh, um, attractive for these sorts of queries than, than snapshot would be, but snapshot does provide advantages. Uh, for one thing, you can multiplex to a higher degree using snapshot than you can with PCR. Um, we, we have, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the example I presented in my talk is 10 different loci queried in a single reaction, um, and sometimes you can go even higher than that. So looking at 10 different loci um, is possible with a single reaction with snapshot. The, the other thing is that snapshot is a little bit more open-ended. You don't necessarily have to know what the exact sequence of the SNP is that you're trying to query. You just need to know that the SNP is there. <laughs> 
and then the enzyme the nucleotides will tell you the nature of, of the uh, of the uh, um, or the SNP that that is, that is at that, that particular locus or that particular site. So, so in other words, with one assay, you can check whether or not there is an A, C, G, or T at a, at a spot. Whereas the TAC genotyping assay, you would require a couple of different reactions in order to make that same determination. So, so it's a little bit more simple to, for for multiplexed queries. Thank you, Steve. Thank you both for your for sharing your experience and your information with us today through our Q&A. Do either of you have any final comments for our audience? Dr. Roy, you want to go first? Well, I would say thank you for your time. And I think it's, it's you know, it has been uh, helpful to share our experience here in the platform. Uh, and you know, we had some great questions. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, and I, I would just like to follow up by, by first of all thanking Dr. Roy for his time. It was it was very uh, very uh, interesting to hear about his work and, and his thoughts on this. Um, one thing I would like to to thank the audience uh, for and leave you with is that Thermo Fisher is, is is more than a provider of tools. Thermo Fisher is a partner for for addressing certain problems, and and we would like to to help you do the best science that you possibly can. So we encourage you to reach out to us, to talk to us, and let let us help you. Uh, um, navigate the landscape of what's available and, and make the best choices for what you need to do. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. I do want to thank Dr. C. Jackson and Dr. Somak Roy for their time today and for their important research. I would also like to thank Labroots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I do want to thank our audience also for joining us today and for their, for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those that are submitted during the on-demand period, they will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. So to piggyback on what Steve said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Just go ahead and submit that question through the Q&A box and you can do that during the on-demand period and someone will reach out to you. Today's webcast can also be viewed on demand and Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Until next time, everyone, have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.